Since I've been harping about how important firewalls are, I decided not to give a talk about them. Um, that's, that's because it would have been negative. Um, no matter what anyone here tells you, I'll just col collectively insult all the people who think they can get rid of firewalls. I'll do it here once. They're wrong. Ask me why. Um, I would love to get rid of them, by the way. I'd love to get rid of them. Um, but I, I don't think it's been done. Um, so instead, I'll talk about something that I think I can prove, even though it's perhaps not quite as dramatic. Um, so um, there, this goes back to some of my own work from about 10, 15 years ago. There's evidence that there's a universal relation between geometry and information. Um, this, informa this, this relation could be uh, uh, described by this sentence. The information on a light sheet is bounded by the difference between its initial and final area. Uh, and in this talk, uh, I will give a proof of this statement in a certain non-trivial but limited regime. Um, <coughs> And uh, of course, I need to start by uh, reviewing what the red sentence is actually supposed to mean in detail. OK, so uh, it's a statement of the covariant entropy bound. Um, and uh, what I want you to be uh, aware of to start with is uh, I'll be talking a lot about two-dimensional surfaces, such as the uh, uh, wall of this room or the surface of a sphere. But I will always mean specifically such a surface specified at some instant of time. So I really want it to be two-dimensional, not two plus one-dimensional world tube or something. Um, and uh, such a surface has the property that it has four sides, as you may not have known. But if you think about light rays, it has four sides. Uh, namely, you could have light rays emitted from it at that instant of time um, orthogonally. Uh, to the inside or outside of the surface. Um, but then you also could have light rays arriving at that instant of time from the past, either at the inside or at the outside of the surface. So you have four orthogonal null directions. This is going to be important, so please ask me if it's not clear. Um, and, and so you can, you can go backwards. You can start by picking a surface, and you can construct Null hypersurfaces, two plus one dimensional surfaces, and two of the directions in them are space-like space and one is light-like, um, four directions away from any null, uh, so, sorry, from any two dimensional spatial surface. And, and in fact, you can do this locally. Here I've just drawn a piece of a spatial surface, the black line. Of course, I had to suppress one spatial dimension, but I hope it's okay. Uh, and I've shown you the four orthogonal directions. And, um, I need one more thing to tell you what a light sheet is. A light sheet is not just any null hypersurface orthogonal to the original surface of area A. Um, you have to pick out of these four directions, you have to pick ones which, which, which have the area contracting as you go away from the original surface. So here's an example, some uh, elliptic shaped original surface. I've kind of projected out the time direction here. I'm just looking at how the size of the thing changes as you follow the light rays away from it. And you see it's getting smaller that will make a nice light sheet. So the generating light rays have to be non-expanding away from the initial surface. And you can, you can encode that in the mathematical statement that theta, the expansion of the congruence, uh, has to be non-positive. So theta can be uh, written uh, in this, 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 as, as, a, as a trace of a derivative of the tangent vector along the light rays. It's locally defined, by the way. What you're really doing is, and I find this, this second definition much more intuitive. It's the logarithmic derivative of a cross-sectional area element that's spanned by the light ray and its neighboring light rays. And you're asking, is that area element getting smaller or larger as you follow the light ray along? And so everywhere you can just ask, is this true or not? If it's true, you're doing great. It's a light sheet. So here's an example. The simplest example is sphere in flat space. Again, I'm suppressing one spatial dimension, so it looks like a circle. Time goes up. And, and in this case, this non-expansion condition simply reproduces our intuitive notion of inside. Okay, if you have a sphere and you follow the light rays towards what you would usually call the inside, well, the cross-sectional area will get smaller and smaller until the light rays meet in the center. Whether you do this to the past or future doesn't really matter. Uh, but the outside directions are not OK, so I've drawn them kind of thin. Um, so here's the statement. We're ready for the statement of the covariant entropy bound. It's a conjecture. Um, in an arbitrary space-time, uh, choose an arbitrary two-dimensional surface B. It doesn't have to be closed, by the way, because of the fact that these things are all locally defined, um, of area A. Uh, and then pick any of the possibly multiple light sheets that you can construct away from B. 
Uh, and then what's supposed to be true is that the entropy of the matter that's captured on this, on this light sheet, in the same sense that you know, there's matter in, in, this, in this room, it has some entropy, you could ask, well, what's the matter on the light sheet? You know, light rays are com coming in from the boundaries of the room. Well, that's the same thing, right? You, you're all, your world lines are passing through that. That entropy is less than the original area in Planck units. So I've suppressed the speed of light, which would make an appearance here, but I've kept G Newton and H bar. And G H bar is, well, it, it, it's the square of a length scale, the Planck length, which is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. It's a very small length. So the number of qubits that is the upper bound in the entropy you can visualize by putting little Planck tiles, 10 to the mini, minus 33 centimeters on each side, uh, on, the, on the initial surface for this room, that'd be a rather large number. But it's interesting that it goes like the area. Um, and, and why am I being so difficult here? Why do I have to talk about light rays? I just want to remind those of you who, or tell those of you who may not have heard about this stuff, why we're forced to do this. Uh, the, the, why is this true in the first place? Or how did we come upon this idea? It's because of black holes. You try to put more, black, more entropy into a region of space. You, you make a black hole, and black holes have entropy of area A. They seem to be the largest amount of entropy that you can put in a given region uh, surrounded by um, a, a surface of area A. But as soon as you try to make this precise and say, well, the entropy in some volume is always less than the area of the surface bounding that volume, it turns out that that's actually wrong. And people came up with one proposal after another uh, that, 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 that tried to fix this. And so I just want to illustrate how the uh, null condition gets around this. So I've already shown you that for an ordinary sphere in, in almost flat space, if gravity is weak, it's basically the same thing anyway. The light rays see the same volume or the same matter that, that you would have described by saying it's the enclosed volume. But, but here, we, here are some examples where, where the light sheets do better. This is a closed universe here on the left. It's, a time, it's, it's one instant of time of a closed universe. Again, I'm suppressing one spatial dimension, so this is a three-sphere. And um, I'm considering the volume of almost the entire three-sphere except for a small polar cap. And so the boundary area here is very, very small. I can make it arbitrarily small, but of course the entropy is arbitrarily large if I consider a big universe filled with radiation or something. Um, then the entropy in this striped volume there is, is huge. And I would have an, an immediate contradiction. And not just a little bit, you know, a factor of two or something, but infinity <laughs> to zero. Um, and, and on the other hand, uh, to construct the light sheets, of course, we have to take more of a space-time point of view. We have to know what happens uh, both in space and in time. So I've drawn here a space-time picture, a so-called Penrose diagram. Uh, the important thing to notice, though, even if you don't understand Penrose diagrams, um, is it, in this case, it's pretty obvious, right? If you look at the directions away from this area uh, in which the light rays are going to be decreasing, as long as this, this uh, sphere is not very rapidly expanding or contracting, it's going to be towards the North Pole. That's where the sphere is going to get smaller. If you try to go towards the South Pole, uh, well, you can see that it, you know, the cross-sectional areas get larger. Um, and that's indeed what's happening here. So the light sheets automatically know that this blue area here has something to do with the entropy on the, on the right and not with the entropy on the left. And it works also quantitatively, although I won't show you that. Um, another example is an expanding flat universe. Um, I'm making it flat because in that case you know that the spatial geometry is Euclidean. You know that areas grow like R squared and volumes grow like R cubed. Um, and we know that the entropy density is a constant because it's a homogeneous universe. And so I know that by just choosing a large enough sphere, well, I multiply that volume by the uh, fixed entropy density, eventually I'm going to beat R squared, no matter what constant I divide it by. Uh, the volume grows faster than the area. But again, the space time, in this case, the space time evolution is really important. I've drawn here a slice of, of constant time, the thin line. Uh, and the, the surfaces that are, you know, the spheres that are small, well, they're like in flat space, as always. So, yeah, you can, you can then construct light sheets and they will have, they will see the same matter that you would see on a volume enclosed by the sphere. But for surfaces that are very, spheres that are very, very large, which are the ones that we had to go to to get into this limit of, of, of you know, volume beating the area, um, for those, only past-directed light sheets are allowed 
because there's a Big Bang and the universe is expanding and you're actually getting contraction by going towards the Big Bang. That contraction of the universe towards the Big Bang is the most important effect for large spheres. And so only those are allowed and those, as you can see down here, get truncated by the Big Bang. Those light sheets don't get all the way to the center where r is equal to zero and they don't see as much entropy as you would have in the volume. And again, quantitatively, you can check that it works. And then a final example, which is almost like the time reversed of what I just described, is, is a collapsing star. Its area inside the black hole that it's making, uh, is its surface area is going to zero. Uh, its entropy can't go down. Uh, the vo a, a volume type bound would be violated. Uh, the light sheet gets truncated in this case by the future singularity because only future directed light sheets are allowed in this trapped region. Space is collapsing very rapidly. And so only those are the con contracting directions. Okay, one more um, point of review. Uh, there's a fairly natural generalization of the covariant entropy bound. So far, I was always drawing these light sheets, you know, all the way until the light waves start intersecting with each other. Um, but of course, you could stop sooner, and then the light sheets just wouldn't pick up some of the matter that they would have otherwise seen. Um, they don't reach as far. Uh, and so the bound is then more trivially satisfied if it was satisfied to start with. Uh, but Flanagan, Merov, and Wald had the idea of saying, well, in that case, maybe we can just tighten the right-hand side of the bound and make it more interesting again. And, and so their idea was, well, if I stop after um, you know, some finite amount of affine parameter along the light rays, then the cross-sectional area they span is not yet zero. It's some finite area. It's smaller than the initial one by assumption of this, this uh, this condition, non-expansion condition. So let's subtract it off and use the difference as the upper bound. And that actually turns out to be a very interesting uh, proposal because unlike the ordinary covariant entropy bound, which seems to be saturated only by very strongly gravitating systems such as black holes, um, this bound can be approximately saturated uh, in a regime where gravity is absolutely negligible. Um, and and I, I want to describe this here. Uh, with uh, uh, like this. So suppose you have a bunch of parallel light rays. Okay, and here is a wave packet of some light particle. And if, if it's massive, I want the, wave, the wavelength to be shorter than the, the Compton wavelength, but you could just say it's a photon or something. It has some, it has some uh, characteristic size lambda. It'll have energy h bar over lambda. Um, and these light rays have initially some cross-sectional area A. Okay, and then they, they, get, they get focused a tiny little bit. It seems ridiculous, but this is like the sun bending light rays. Okay, it just doesn't have very much energy. And then at the other end, I can put sort of an image plate and ask how much is the cross-sectional area now. Okay, so think of this as a round plate, orthogonal light rays. Uh, I, I, I have the initial expansion B0 because that gives me the tightest possible uh, test of the bound. I don't want to lose area unnecessarily. I want to lose it only by focusing. Um, and then this area difference here can be computed by the usual formula. This angle here is something like gm over r. Um, and, and, you know, this is, this is r, sorry, lambda in this case. Um, and if you put it all together, you find that the, the annulus of area that you've lost by focusing, so the delta a, this a minus a prime that appears here, um, is of order one in Planck units. Okay, the h bar comes in through here. The G comes in through here. Um, so delta A over GH bar is, is, is a, an order one number. Okay, that's, that just happens to be true. A, a, a photon wave packet focuses light by one Planck area, roughly. Um, and so you can see, well, what I didn't say is the entropy, of course, is also of order one. Let's say you have two polarization states or something, so entropy is of log two. Or you could have multiple different species that might be in here. Uh, so it's log of a few. And so it's interesting, we're, we're, the left and the right hand side are both order one. So in fact, maybe, maybe the bound is even violated, though it's hard to make this precise because you know, what exactly are you gonna define to be the, uh, the boundaries of this wave packet? Um, if you try to localize it too sharply, it has a lot more energy. You get confused. And you get confused because it's very hard to define the entropy of a system that's localized to a finite region, whether that's a volume or a piece of light sheet. And so it'd be very nice to be able to make this more precise. And this is where there's been progress over the last few years. 
I should first say how we've usually, you know, in all those other examples with cosmology and so on, how was I defining the entropy? I was defining it kind of the way we always do. We look at something, we know it's a star, okay, we can calculate the entropy, we're not into the subtleties of this. Uh, it's the log of the number of independent quantum states compatible with some coarse graining condition, in this case the condition that the matter system has to fit on a light sheet. Let me draw it as a space-time picture, here's a light sheet. Here's my matter system, the star passes through this light sheet. Um, and, and that's five, good. Uh, and that's something that, that we, can, we can do and get away with most of the time. It's very good, good enough for discriminating, for example, between the covariant bound and competing proposals like this space-like bound that I put up as a straw man there. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, but now we want to do better than this, okay? This is clearly not completely sharp. Under what conditions is some system localized to some spatial region that we're specifying? It's actually confusing because usually there are tails of modes that stretch across the boundary. Um, and uh, in fact, this is completely generic in quantum field theory. Um, in particular, if we're not imposing any physical boundary conditions uh, at the two ends of the light sheet, which we usually don't want to do. Um, and in fact, we know very well that even the vacuum has entanglement across any surface. And this uh, entanglement gives divergent von Neumann entropy for the density matrix of the vacuum restricted to some finite region. Okay. So, so as I've already noted... Um, so isn't that only through in the absence of a cutoff? Is that yeah, yeah. So it's it, right. Some, something that, that then you could put a cutoff on, but it's, it's divergent before you have the cutoff. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, so, so, so I, I don't have a general answer to this problem, um, but, but as I've said, the generalized covariant bound is, is non-trivial. In the perturbative regime, where the, you know, where, where the focusing, this angle by which light rays get bent, let's say, is very, very small, arbitrarily small. We can take g to zero, uh, and the area difference in units of gh bar will remain finite. That's very important. Right. Um, and so the bound is non-trivial, but in this regime, limited, admittedly, a sharp definition of the entropy is possible um, and, in fact, allows you to give a perturbative proof of the generalized covariant entropy bound in that regime, which I find remarkable because I always expected that one would need more explicit assumptions than I will end up needing about the relation between entropy and energy. I mean, after all, what's, what's focusing the light rays is, is energy. What you're comparing it to is an entropy. How does this work? I'm still somewhat puzzled by it. Um, the relevant definition of entropy, which is very elegant and physically appropriate, um, is to simply take the difference between the energy that the matter system would have. Let me just draw a new picture here. So here's, uh, maybe let me try to make it a little more di three-dimensional. So here's an initial and a final area, A and A prime. So I'm thinking of the light rays as being emitted from here, going to there. And here's some matter system that's passing through this. Let me describe this matter system by a state rho uh, global. And I'm really giving you, this could be mixed or pure, I'm giving you the state in the entire space time. Let's say this is in Minkowski space. Um, and I'm including gravity perturbatively in terms of how much focusing I'm going to get uh, of light rays by this system. Uh, I can then define some density matrix uh, rho that is the restriction of rho global just to this region here. Okay, and I can compute of a Neumann entropy for that density matrix, which I'm going to call S rho. And I can do the same thing for the vacuum, sorry, which is definitely a pure state. Restricted to this region, the vacuum will be a density matrix rho zero. And I can subtract that off from the one, I can subtract the associated von Neumann entropy off. And they, they both have the same divergence. They both have a quadratic divergence with a cutoff near the boundaries, but those cancel because at, 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 at short wavelengths, both of these states, this being a finite energy state, look like the vacuum. Um, and so that gives a nice definition. It has good properties. Uh, if you know, you know, if this is a star and it's well separated from these boundaries, it'll reproduce what you think the entropy of the star is. And um, if, if it's, well, one thing I should say is, uh, if you increase the number of species that you might have in here enormously, you don't know which one it is, 
Usually, well, this guy here, the global entropy, will have a divergence that goes like the log of the number of species, because you have that, that number of different quantum states you could have in here, and you don't know which. Um, but the reduced density matrix um, appropriate to just this interval will not grow indefinitely with the number of species. And this is, in fact, physically appropriate. Uh, what's happening is that an observer who has only access to this region is unable to discriminate between too many different species because of the thermal noise that, that uh, surrounds him. Uh, so this was shown explicitly by Cassini uh, in his paper. Uh, so now the rest is very easy. We just have to put together a mathematical result of um, quantum mechanics. There's something called the relative entropy, which is not the same thing as this that I just defined. It's not the difference between two von Neumann entropies, but it's the difference between something that's not a von Neumann entropy and something that is. Uh, and I just, I'm just going to use it and then drop it. Uh, it satisfies the important conditions of positivity and monotonicity. If you restrict to a subalgebra, it's non-increasing. Um, and the other ingredient I need is called the modular Hamiltonian. You can think of it as the log of the vacuum state. And I apologize. I called the vacuum state rho zero here, and now I'm calling it sigma. It's the same thing. Um, and and it's, it sounds like a very formal thing. But first of all, you can show in a few lines that the positivity of the relative entropy implies that the Cassini entropy, this difference between matter and, and vacuum entropy, uh, is always less than this bizarre modular Hamiltonian I've just formally defined. Um, but more importantly, the modular Hamiltonian can be related to the area increase of a causal horizon and also to the area difference of one of these light sheets that I'm worried about. It actually turns out to have this physical interpretation as an area difference. And to see this, I'll give you an example. In Rindler space, this is what the modular Hamiltonian turns out to be, according to uh, these people from 1975. Um, and, and you, can, you can easily check that you get the same integral if you compute using the Ray Chaudhuri equation how much area loss you have starting at infinite affine parameter going down to the, uh, to, to the bifurcation point of the Rindler horizon. Uh, you lose as much area except you have a G Newton in front instead of a 1 over H bar. So the relationship between the modular Hamiltonian and the area difference has a 1 over G H bar in it, but otherwise they're the same thing. And since positivity of the relative entropy implies that the Cassini entropy is less than the modular Hamiltonian, the generalized second law follows. Whatever falls through the Rindler horizon focuses the area at least so much that the area growth, that you later have a larger Rindler horizon, makes up for the lost Cassini entropy. Okay. So again, I want to emphasize this is at leading order in G Newton. I have dropped terms in the Ray Chaudhuri equations that are nonlinear. Um, so you can generalize this. Let me skip that. Uh, in particular, uh, you can extend this to causal horizons, such as the horizon of a black hole, and to arbitrary slices of it. So you can show that the entropy plus the area is a quantity that's non-decreasing, as the generalized second law demands. What we did was we were interested in these finite regions, and there were additional problems we faced. Um, the, the most severe is that the modular Hamiltonian for a finite region, first of all, if it was a finite spatial region, it would be a disaster. It's not even a local expression. It, it's, it's some horrible thing. On a light-like region, it looks like this. So it's local. That's progress. But it's not obviously related to an area difference. If the null energy condition held, it would be, because 1 minus x is the extra thing that appeared here. It's, it's less than 1. And so we could continue the inequality as long as t plus plus is positive. Um, the, the stress tensor crossing the horizon. Uh, but of course, there are uh, quantum states where it's not positive. In fact, you can find explicit examples where the Cassini entropy would be greater than the area difference if we start, as usual, with, initi with initially not, uh, parallel light rays. And the trick turned out to be that if the null energy condition is violated, it's actually not OK necessarily to start with initially parallel light rays because they can be anti-focused and can start having positive expansion away from the initial surface. And that's not allowed. Then the light sheet would have to be terminated already here, and it wouldn't get far enough to pick up all the state we wanted. 
Okay, so in, that, in those cases, you have to put in the condition that you, you have to start the light waves already strictly contracting in order to compensate for the later anti-focusing. And when you put that all together, surprisingly enough, you find again the inequality that you wanted and the generalized covariant bound follows, and that's it. Uh, I want to stress that uh, observer dependence here is crucial, otherwise you'd have a species problem. Um, the uh, non-expansion on the entire light sheet is crucial. You might have thought that it's enough to assume the null energy condition and, and, uh, and, and contract, but you get no, no interesting statement out of that. Um, and uh, what I find fascinating is that we needed no energy conditions. We only needed what's hidden in the implicit assumption that the vacuum is stable. So we, we were subtracting a vacuum entropy, and that means that we're assuming there exists a vacuum. And if you have matter which is too thick, then there does not exist a vacuum. So that, that, but that's all that was needed here. Um, be nice to invert this, turn it around, derive something about classical gravity from entropy bounds. Um, and of course the big question is what's the analog of this reference state, rho zero, for the non-perturbative case where uh, the, the, the focusing is very considerable. Um, and the take hope slogan is, well, uh, information tells space-time how to curve, space-time tells information how to disappear. Thank you.